Well, there's a lot, a lot for us to think about and to discuss in the time that we have left. I'm going to come back to you in succession uh, with a question from me, and then I want the other three of you. For example, my first question will go to Dr. Hanchard, and then I want the others of you to, to ask him your own questions. But Dr. Hanchard, you, I mean, diversity is something we are all thinking harder about these days. Why has it been so hard, do you think, in the, the scientific professions and the medical professions to institute more diversity, racially, ethnically, and so on? Yeah, no, that's a great question, although, you know, complex. Um, <clears throat> you know, one of the things about, you know, engaging communities is that you have to have a measure of trust. Um, and when it comes to engaging uh, cohorts and communities and involving them in research, often that trust barrier is, is a great one, um, particularly for communities that have traditionally been underrepresented. Many of those communities have also, you know, been exploited in, in particularly in research contexts. And so there is this trust barrier, particularly in the United States, to being able to engage these communities to participate in the research. Um, and so, you know, the groups who have had the most success with this have established much longer term kind of interactions where they, you know, it's not just a sort of one and done type of deal where they're sort of going into those communities and engaging with community leaders, but then also with individuals from that community. So that's part of it. Um, another part is, as I said, the, the sort of inextricable kind of link between who you study and who is doing the studying. You know, it's not necessarily quantified as well as it perhaps could be, but if you talk to people from communities, they want to see their own people who are, you know, looking after them. They want those people to be part of the study as well. And, and groups where that has happened have had a lot more success in being able to recruit individuals. So it's kind of a dual kind of thing, at, at least at that kind of level, to be able to engage these communities. Um, so some of these things are sort of simple things to sort of outline and, and sort of well known, but harder things to overcome. And that's where I think we need to be a little bit more nuanced and clever about how we think about it. I think generally people think about diversity and they want more diversity, but not necessarily realize that the purpose of that diversity is to make things more creative, is to allow people to think about things differently. And so people often want diversity, but they want the same status quo just with people who are more diverse looking. And <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think we have to sort of make sure that that is an actual shift and not just a, a, a sort of whitewash. What do you think is easier to do? Neither one is easy, but which is less difficult, shall we say, changing who is studied or changing who's doing the studying? Yeah, I think that who, who we study is, as I said, particularly in the United States, some of the past histories and so on have created some real almost chasms <laughs> in terms of being able to engage communities. Um, and you hear it all the time. They talk about the Tuskegee experiments. They talk about the Havasu tribe. You know, there, there are lots of examples out there. Um, and so I think that that's a big chasm. I, I think we're probably in a position where, you know, for some of these studies, if we just were able to engage um, individuals who you know, come from those communities and are studying those things, and particularly that that's what they want to study. My sense is that that would be an easier, uh, an easier, you know, a lower hanging fruit. Um, but as you said, they're both very challenging. I'd like the other three of you to speak about your own experiences with diversity. You touched on this, Dr. Zagri. Yeah, I, and I had met, I mean, my, the team I work with had an amazing, surprising experience. We have a group of scientists who solve the unsolvable diseases, neurological diseases. So. And some of those get enrolled with an NIH-funded undiagnosed disease network program where people get sequenced and you try to solve the, the mystery. To our surprise, we realized that people who don't have medical insurance are less likely to be enrolled in that program because they wouldn't get the medical sequencing if those happen to be people from underrepresented groups. So that left out a whole segment of the population with unsolved diseases that couldn't be solved. So a group of investigators at Baylor and Texas Children put together an NIH grant specifically to Neil's uh, point to target that population and begin to solve their <coughs> problems and called it the Texome Project. It's in Texas and they made it in Spanish and English because many are Hispanic who didn't even know this is accessible to them. 
And it's amazing within it's, it's NIH funded and locally funded by the institutions. Together now they've solved over 27 cases that have been left unsolved within the first year. But this is again, it's, to your question, it's really who needs the help and who is doing the help. We need to be communicating. That surprised me that this whole segment was left unstudies until we became alert that this is not happening. No question. What about the two of you? What thoughts? Yeah, and, and maybe I can jump uh, in on what Neil said because he already spoke to the, uh, to the historical explanations for, for a lack of trust. And it also goes back to, to Victor's point from earlier about you know, rebuilding trust. And for us, of course, it often becomes a communication question in, in the field that I work in. Um, and, and, and it becomes actually a lot more complicated when you don't just look at, at historical um, uh, events that may have driven this lack of trust, but, but just the realities of 2022 and an African-American mother in the U.S. that between conception and childbirth is 300% more likely to die than a white mother. Um, that's not a problem of us rebuilding trust. That's a problem of us addressing health disparities. And that's not just a US problem in the UK. I think that rate is even higher at 400%. But one way or the <coughs> other, it's, it's not a matter of saying, well, you know, here, here's why you should trust us. It's actually fixing the very reasons at this very moment in 2022 for, for, for the lack of trust um, that's, not, that's actually not unreasonable at all. Um, and so I think that's where, where the real complexities come in. Uh, and why we've had such a hard time to your earlier question, you know, why has this been so persistent as a problem? I mean, for us, I, I agree with everything said in here. We, we think about diversity in education and the pipeline, right? So, and one of the things that we have done is that we just raised an endowment from our colleague Kimberly Curry in, uh, in Chicago, where we have this program called the RISE program, where we go to a low-income neighborhood and kids from first grade to eighth grade, we bring them to our hospital, to our laboratories. We provide grants for their classwork that they know they're able to buy a microscope or magazines and things. And I think the key is the inspiration that you know, if there are kids who have never been exposed to science and medicine, and now they come in to spend the full day with us, and they get that exposure, you know, out of 100, if we turn two of them on into science, and they think that's a possibility career for them, that's so. That's that has been our approach into sort of increase the pipeline in the way that we have. And I think we, we definitely need to think about elementary, middle school, high school education on science and inspiration because that's gonna change the pipeline and increase diversity as well. Yeah, and I think there's a sort of, um, you know, a sort of synergistic kind of opportunity there as well is that as you change the, the, the mentors as well and have those individuals there, then you know, they're seeing people who look like them who are also scientists, they're also exactly. physicians, and that becomes a more real possibility. Well, we can, we can certainly pick up on that, but I, I'm gonna move on to uh, Dr. Shifley and, and uh, some of the points that you made. It's so interesting to hear you talk about communications because in the field of communications, we are wrestling with these very things that you described. I mean, we are dealing with the, the platforms driven by algorithms that are completely out of our control. We may have discussions with some of these organizations and platforms, but it's way beyond any kind of wall that we're able to penetrate. So, I mean, how do you even think about getting your arms around that? I mean, where do you look for, for practical solutions? You start having conversations with the executives of these organizations. I mean, what do you, how do you, th how do you think about that? Yeah. And, and I think it's really important. I mean, when I, when what I outlined almost sounded like a, a condemnation of these platforms, right? this is, it makes a lot of fiscal sense for these platforms to do what they do. Um, and, and that obviously is not the only driver, but it's certainly one of the major drivers. Um, but there's also gonna be, I think, increasingly a policy question. I think we're seeing from both parties now a push to think more carefully, both political parties, I mean, a push to think more carefully about the democratic value um, of those platforms. And I think for different reasons, they're thinking about regulating. And I think that creates a very unique window of opportunity, especially for a convener um, of conversations like the National Academies without a proverbial skin in the game. It might say, well, you know, there is no reason for you to not pursue certain fiscal goals, but there's also no reason to not couple those fiscal goals with pro-democratic goals. And I think we've all seen during COVID where that can get us. 
um, if we don't do that. So the idea of, of saying, can we, for example, figure out ways to prioritize information potentially or, or, or sources of information uh, that we know to be more in line with the best available science over others. Uh, so that simply, uh, we know from studies that m few of us, if any, go beyond the first page of Google searches. So whatever ends up showing up on that first page is crucially important for our information intake. Um, we know that our timelines are all curated in a way that, that the social environments that I, that I move in um, influence what shows up prominently on my Twitter or, or other timeline. The problem is if I'm surrounded by social networks that are as uninformed or misinformed even as I am, that just furthers that. So working, I think, a collaboration, and this is my, my, my somewhat tongue-in-cheek point about Kasparov, um, working with platforms to figure out where, our, where we have shared goals and, and, and for the academies to play a role that only it can play because most other places, in, including media organizations, other media or legacy media organizations, have a skin in the game, I think would be a, a, a really important first step in the Standing Committee on Advancing Science Communication that I have the honor of co-chairing for the academies is, is trying to begin some of those conversations and convenings. And, and again, so much depends, of course, on which audience you're trying to reach. Is it the scientific community? Is it the public, broadly speaking? Which is it? What about the other uh, three of you, in your own experience, have you seen particular approaches that seem to be more effective in reaching the public and engendering trust? Or uh, how, do you, how have you seen this? You yeah, know, I've, uh, especially during the pandemic, you know, I got lots of questions from a lot of people um, from, from all over about where they could go to trust information. Um, and so, you know, I guess, I guess maybe a quest question back is, you know, how do, we, how do we sort of not only prioritize, but then tailor that kind of information? You know, people, some communities were getting their information from a very limited, you know, viewpoint. And how do you how do you overcome that, right? Like, you know, how do you ensure that that viewpoint is more representative of the best science? Or, or you know, I, I found that to be particularly challenging <coughs> as well. Is that there was, you know, a certain line that was coming from a certain areas, and and that was hard to overcome. I think you know one one of the key things that uh, we should push forward is open debate, open respectful debate. And I actually wrote it. Editorial on the subject, we had you know people writing me that you know I don't like the decision of this editor, you should fire him or her. <laughs> I don't like this article you got published, you should retract it. I don't like the way the editor has written decision to me, you should do something about it. And, and I wrote an article on you know basically on respectful debate that you know if you hear something that you think is not true, you should get up and ask. You should have a respectful debate, and I think that culture is fantastic in the U.S. And as it is, I come from Iran, you know. In Iran, well, you know what's going on today. You know, there is really not that much freedom, and to have the freedom of standing up and debating, I think that's very important, and we all need to use that power that we have. And I think once we do that, truth will always rise up to the top. Very, what you're describing very much reflects the political yeah. environment, the sea that we're swimming in. Absolutely, this right is now. horrible. Dr. Zagby, any other thoughts? Uh, the only other thought I've learned to deal with in the last two years, particularly to vaccines and knowledge and misinformation, is to really talk to small groups and share my own experience, share, share what I know, and let them feel they're empowered to make the decision. I found that the best approach to get more and more people to really understand and value the science mm -hmm. and then engage. That was the only thing, and I feel that we as a community Yes, it's small people we're affecting. Maybe I was able to communicate with dozens of people or a hundred people, but those people have friends. And if we can keep all of us doing that, I think that would be helpful. That, I've taken it in that very small step-by-step -step approach. That's, that's the positive side of, of the, way, the way it works, right? I mean, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I, I think that's, and, and that, that's a, especially at, in, at the group level, that's a, that's a really useful um, approach. I'm, I'm a little bit less optimistic than Ali that the truth will always <laughs> rise to the top in algorithmic <laughs> losing. <laughs> it's, right? it's, no, no, hope, hope springs eternal. I, I very much agree with you. Um, um, but but I'm, I'm, I, I do think it needs help. Um, and uh, so I'll leave it at well, that. Well, I mean, I, I grew up in a country that if you disagreed with the government, they hung you. 
right? And that's, that's I walk in the street seeing people hanging. My friend's fathers had bullet in their head, right? You know, no one had a chance of arguing. And I think we have, we live in a culture that we can argue and we should take advantage of that. And that ar an argument will come out the right answer. Right. Dr. Salatafor, just to pick up on your remarks earlier, I mean, it has to be disturbing when you describe, as you said, so many of young people leaving to go good. into the different uh, parts of the private sector too, because they, they see how hard the process sure. looks. You, you mentioned, you know, they watch their elders work for a long time to to try to get something published and they don't. What are, I mean, what are the reasons? Is, is it money, it's that, what you just described? What else are we, are, are we talking about? I think, about? you know, a combination of many things, Dr. Zarbi and I had this conversation a long time ago, I was mentioning to her that you know, some of my mentors in biochemistry, people like Arthur Kornberg and, you know, Bill Sly, Vagelos, you know, Rowley, these are fantastic people who were physician and they did science. And I was asking who they know. I don't see it in my medical center. I have two kids in medical school and all of their friends, not, not many people interested in doing science. You know, is it different at Baylor? And she says, well, you know, we have similar issues in here. And that the conversation started several months ago on that, that, you know, why is it that physicians don't want to get into science? And why is it that the PhD students don't want to continue on science? And I think money has a lot to do with it. You know, you go and, you know, I talk to my friends, my kids' friends, you know, you do four years of medical school and uh, you make fifty, fifty-five thousand dollars a year as a resident. You know, my daughter's class, there are six of them, they just basically turn on to financial market and making five times as much. So if you put the value on life on money, then maybe you were not made for science and medicine anyway. So I think that sort of is a way to do it. But when I go to meetings and I you know, I used to go to posters, seventy percent of the people I talked to, they wanted to go do postdocs, academic postdocs. Now when I talk to people, less than 10% want to do that. They all have one reason or another that they want to move on. I think COVID had changed things, right? You know, for, for us, you know, we, I never thought I could stay away from lab, and I never did because once COVID happened, a week later I was back in lab. But there were a lot of people who sat home and worked from home, and maybe at some point they realized, I don't have to be in the lab at all the time, you know? So, and I think that made that realization. I think, you know, a lot of people who had family members dying, and it's major impact that, you know, you see death and you say, I want to do something else with my life. So I think a lot of changes that happen, but at the bottom of it, I think financial support is very important. If you're not able to sustain a life for you and your family, right. and if you have to struggle and to get a little grant and that little grant pays some of your salary and a technician, and you, there's not enough money to do the experiments, and then you go back to renew that grant and you haven't done much to do it, then that becomes frustrating. And then the students are seeing that happening and said, I don't want that life. It, 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 I hear you saying that and it makes sense. And yet I think people watching COVID, the challenges uh, of science and medicine to come up with uh, you know, ways to address it and the next pandemic, God forbid, that's coming down the line, you would think that young people would be inspired to want to go into. Well, you, you would think our government hear, would be inspired. So if you look at the history of development <laughs> of COVID vaccine, seriously, take a look at this. Recombinant DNA technology, molecular biology, and engineering saved the day. You sequence a genome within a weekend. Without instrument of NGS, you wouldn't be able to do it. The recombinant DNA technology existed so you could be able to make the viruses, and the chemists provide us the way, means by which to put, put the drugs, put the viruses into the into the, the RNA into the person and to get translation. So if you look at it, all of these were funded by basic fundamental research. And what has happened at NIH with basic fundamental research in past two years? Anybody talk about increasing it, supporting more R01? No, no talk of that. And I think our government hasn't learned from all the benefit that we have had from investment in NIH. Can I jump in on that really quickly? Because I think, I, I, I mean, a huge plus one, and I think that speaks to one of the challenges we talked about this morning, and that is if something happens and it doesn't get communicated right, we actually have an issue. And one of the things that ended up happening, especially around mRNA-based vaccine uh, platforms for vaccines, is that we, we celebrated this very often in, in the narrative, speaking, going back to the keynote, uh, was really one about a miracle, how quickly we got this together, right? Wasn't it, a, and this even from some health journalists, um, and including social media, saying this, how, how impressive it was to get this done in such a short time. 
which is, of course, a counter narrative to what you just described, meaning we invested in basic science for a long, long, long time, and it started paying off in a short time, but without this investment, it would not have been possible. So yet again, I think a really good illustration for why narratives are crucially important, and especially when it comes to translating through policy, just to echo the, the last points from the, from the keynote. Uh, you know, that's, that's all true. I guess I'm plus one as well, that's the right way to say it. Um, I, I found, however, for instance, that the narrative of how fast we got it in a public sense, that actually, a lot of what I got back was, oh, it was too fast, mm -hmm. right? You know, that mm -hmm. was too quick. There's no way that could be something that we could possibly trust. Yep. Um, and so again, how you sort of um, frame the argument is, is, is gonna be an important one. Um, and I think that sort of relates also to the idea there is absolutely a financial sort of like pull for people, particularly postdocs and, and, and young trainees who are coming through. There's just so much more that can be had outside of the academic um, pipelines. But we also need to work about the pull, right, in terms of ensuring that people understand, you know, just why we do academia. Who has been very good to share her story, but it's stories like that that are gonna continue to inspire people um, to, to continue in academic medicine. Ruta, do you wanna? Dr. Zogby, do you want to? <laughs> no, that's okay. So I do think, I, I do feel finances is a big deal. Many people, medical students have debt. So a true physician who is interested in research can't really afford unless they get some funding and protected time to do so. Uh, postdocs, their salaries are quite low, relatively speaking. Many administrators at the university with college degrees make, you know, administrative assistants make more money than the postdocs and they have families and they don't have childcare. So all of these things play into it and it seems that the door of, of biotech and industry that will secure their financial future and that they're doing great science. What they don't realize, that's short term because still the hard work, a lot of the primary discoveries happen in academia and I think for us to keep that pipeline, we need people in all aspects of research both industry and academia. Um, any, any one of you want to say anything else about that? I mean, there's so much to say um, about it. Um, I'm looking again at, at what you s talked about earlier, Dr. Zogby, about the, um, the need to um, uh, make sure that physicians have, that physicians are included and have access to the latest scientific uh, data. It's not something the public is, is very aware of. So how do you get that message out to the communities? The sign, I mean, obviously you're here speaking at this group, but I mean, how do you get that word out, do you think? So I think this is part of thinking for the future. I think we're used traditionally to scientists doing the re research and clinicians just taking care of the patients and handling the patients. But I think there's an opportunity in science today that every physician touching a patient can be part of this big science uh, machine and can advance knowledge. But they need a little bit of protected time. They're under pressure to perform. Their hospital administrators telling them you have to bring so much money to earn your salary. Perhaps with some small investment to allow the clinicians the freedom to interact with basic researchers, provide them tissue, uh, provide them information. I think it's a shift in culture that we use everybody in the biomedical community to help us advance science. Is and it, it doesn't take much. It just takes some co and recognizing collaborations and giving people a little time to think and breathe and be part of the engine of research. So does most of the impetus need to come from the medical side or from the I think science? It, I think it has, it has to really, it's a community. It has to be from the funders. The NIH should recognize this person is a clinician. They have absolutely no track record in research, but they're seeing patients and taking tissue every day. That tissue would be so valuable if we give them protected time so that they can organize the consent and do all that it takes to pass that tissue to a basic scientist. That's a success. The neurosurgeon is handling the human brain every day. If we give them protected time, to tally information that could be fed into research or machine learning al algorithm that would be so helpful. So it's funders, it's chairs of departments, it's clinicians realizing they have a role to play in the science 
machine, and of course scientists being introduced to clinicians. So it's, it's a whole culture shift, but it has so much opportunity and so much power. I want the three of you to, to weigh in to it, okay. Yeah, no, as, as a physician scientist myself, I can't sort of underscore what Huda said uh, enough. You know, I think that the, the, the pressures of time, you know, up to a year and a half ago, I was actively seeing patients, and it was a problem. Just, you have work RVUs and, you know, various pressures, and, you know, the clinical enterprise has their own goal. They are working to see patients. That's how they make money. That's how, that's how the, the business <coughs> works. And so it's very much at odds with sometimes the sort of um, scientist viewpoint, which is sometimes it takes time, and you have to sort of invest in learning about the patient in more detail. Um, and so, as Huda says, you have to be able to sort of bridge those two things, and that's gonna have to come from both sides. And that isn't, you know, I am sort of have to mention, or else I won't get back into my house, that, you know, that's their home pressures that then also come on top of that, right, in terms of um, particularly, uh, you know, so women in the workforce and the pressures that they have on top of that. So if you add that, to the clinical pressures, to the scientific pressures, it's, it becomes unsustainable. And, and just to add one uh, thought on the catalytic role that philanthropy can play, and there's also lessons to be learned from other fields, uh, education has some of the same questions and, and problems, meaning lots of really great research in universities that doesn't immediately or fast enough translate into practice in classrooms where there are very different pressures, time pressures, and so on. And the William T. Grant Foundation has created um, a long time ago now that has, has funded over time these research practice partnerships saying, can we actually incentivize fiscally and free up time for researchers and for practitioners to work together for the benefit of getting the best available signs into an elementary school classroom, for example. And I think they're really models to, to, to take and lift, both in terms of how, how these collaborations can work, but also how philanthropy can play a, a catalytic role. I mean, comes from audience. Do, do, do. Yeah, you want to add no, a thought? No, I mean, I 100% agree. Questions. I mean, I grew up with a grandfather who was a physician scientist, so I'm a great believer in the awesome power of medicine and science and back. Your grandfather was what? I didn't physician know. scientist. Physician he's scientist. He's a radiologist okay. and a physicist. And so, so, so basically, what it takes at all level, you have to start from the kindergarten all the way down to medical school. And I think it's just a, it's a cultural change that you have to do research to understand biology and then back to get into medicine. All right, we are now gonna uh, entertain some questions from you, and I think you are standing in line. So if you would just identify yourself and your organization and ask your question. Thank you very much, Jeffrey Lieberman, Columbia University. I just wanted to make three quick comments on uh, the topics discussed. Uh, I think there's a lack of alignment between the aspirational goals and the circumstances on the ground which incentivize or disincentivize uh, young aspiring scientists, whether they're clinical clinicians who want to become scientists or their backgrounds, in the sense that um, when you're an instructor, an assistant professor, your goals are you need to make a salary, you need to get promoted, you need to do research and publish in order to do so. Um, the reality is that what science aspires to do is to answer the key questions that will enhance population health and answer scientific questions. And that alignment is not necessarily what motivates people to get publications onto their CV, which will then be able to uh, encourage a promotions committee to advance them in terms of academic rank and get them published or get grants. Secondly, um, on the diversity issue, um, if you're doing we just, I just want to, because uh, we do want to move to some other people too. Do you want to comment on what he just said? Um, that one response? No right, go ahead and make your second <laughs> point. No, well, okay. the, the, the point I'm making is that there's, a, a, as somebody who mentored and it came up in the same way that Dr. Zogby did, um, individuals are eager to get things on the CV and publish in journals which may or may not be aligned with the key scientific questions in public interest. Uh, one way to deal with that is to have a set of guidelines or a, 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 a statement from the academy or from any sort of governing bodies as to 
what the imperatives that should frame careers and should be considered in terms of incentivizing the uh, uh, directions that young investigators take on their uh, career paths and their mentors. On the diversity issue, there's a practical problem that occurs, which is if you're doing clinical research, your subjects come from your catchment area population in whatever geographic area you are. The NIH now requires a certain, uh, actually, uh, a statement of the different groups that you need to fulfill to uh, achieve a diversity expectation or, uh, 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 or goal. And um, I was a co-author on two uh, articles on clinical trials that were published in the New England Journal in which, in one case, uh, the criticism was a lack of diversity in terms of adequate number of African Americans or Hispanic, and the other, there was too many. Um, uh, and so if there is a need to try and uh, ensure that that kind of representation occurs, then the investigator or the CROs that are doing these studies needs to select sites based on that. And then the third thing is uh, for you, Judy, um, except with the exception of PBS, uh, when I was president of the American Psychiatric Association and tried to act as a spokesperson about mental illness and psychiatry, I learned uh, that producers and editors are constantly struggling with the tension between uh, viewers and topics that will be either clickbait or attract attention and what the public needs to be informed about. And I'm not sure how to get around that, but I think that's been a real impediment as to uh, the quality and the amount of information about science and medicine that gets communicated through the mainstream media outlets. Okay, we appreciate your comments. Uh, do any of you want to want to respond? We do have a number of other people who I believe have questions too. Um, Anybody? All right. Uh, a question. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed the session. My name is Anne Marie Rafferty. Very proud to be a new inductee. I'm sorry, I cannot hear or oh. understand. So, I don't, I don't think it's working, that microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Louder, please. <laughs> because they've been the infrastructure of randomized controlled trials for years, including COVID trials. But how can we value the contribution that nurses make and how have the panel been working with nurses? Do they see that as part of the solution to diversify the research and scientific enterprise? Thank you. Thank you. What about the role of nurses? One of you would like to, to tackle that? I'll, I'll be happy to tackle that. There very critical to the success of the research. And to your point, many nurses and nurse practitioners are not participating, not only in bringing, actually giving physicians the opportunity to bring tissues for research, but also in clinical trials and many other aspects. And I think many people here who do both translational and clinical research will attest to that. Here, question, please. Yes, I don't have a question, but I do have a comment that everybody, everyone in this audience could act on. And that is that we have done nothing in our institutions, by and large, to uh, improve the capacity of uh, primary and secondary school science teachers to teach science and to teach it uh, uh, in a way that reflects the way we practice science. For 30 years, I've operated a program at Columbia University called the Summer Research Program for Secondary School Science Teachers. Uh, the, the outcome of that program is that 10% more of their kids pass the Regents' exam. They stay in uh, teaching, science teaching longer. 
uh, than non-participating uh, teachers, and the program is extremely cost-effective. Every one of you in this audience could start a similar program. The program was published in Science Magazine in 2009 as a report of uh, uh, actual research, outcomes research, showing the program is beneficial. Uh, and I'd be glad to talk to anyone who is interested in doing that. If we're ever to change what happens in our schools, it won't change be until we change the quality and quantity of teachers, and the best way to do that yeah. is to bring them into our, our laboratories, our universities, our research institutes, and make it a welcoming environment for them. They'll bring their kids in, and their kids, and they'll have contacts to find places for their kids in the summer. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a groundswell. We have in this audience Wynn Arias, who created uh, the demystifying medicine program at the NIH. Uh, we have lots of ways in which we, not some government authority, but we can change things. And I just exhort all of you to, uh, to do what you can in your own institutions, because uh, this is not a problem that can be solved at any level other than the ground level. Thank you. I see everyone here nodding and agreeing Absolutely. that 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 is an excellent idea. Maybe well submit an article um, for science advances. And, and we have these programs. Have to review it though. Sure. <laughs> We actually have a program at our institution, to your point, for kindergarten and for high school. So we have it through that. So that's a great suggestion. We, we have the same through the RISE yes. program at yeah. Northwestern. So. Is it for teachers? Wonderful. Teachers, students, students, and college students, very broad. Right. Ours is endowed, actually, so we provide resources for them as well. Question, yes. Uh, Roger McClellan. Uh, I'm an uh, independent advisor in toxicology, risk analysis. Albuquerque, New Mexico, a member of the class of 1990. I'm going to offer a comment and challenge the statement in terms of this group as representative of the biomedical and health sciences scientific enterprise. It absolutely is not. Our big problem, I think, is breaking down the walls of the elitist silo that we live and work in. When I said that to a group of students last week, I could see they're very perplexed. And finally, one of them spoke up boldly and said, Dr. McClellan, what is a silo? And I didn't realize I had a, a cultural background of growing up in the Midwest. I knew what a silo was. <laughs> they didn't. So I'm going to talk about two silos. <laughs> Science, broadly, versus the public. We are a sub-piece of that broad public. We need to break down the silo walls and start communicating with the public broadly. They also are elitists. My plumber is a damn elite plumber, and I'm thankful for that. Likewise, the person who does my taxes is an elitist accountant. The other silo wall, and it came up over and over, is academia as sort of the scientific paradigm. I'm sorry, it is not. The COVID is a great example. Yes, we built on basic science, but it was a private sector also prepared. I'll ask those here who are employed by a private sector employer to raise your hand. 
Wow. We are not representative. Science doesn't start and end in academia. Fortunately, most of our scientists are engaged outside of academia. Let's break down the silo walls and start communicating with a broader community. We can, we can take one more question. All right. I Does, just want to see if anyone here on the panel has a response. We've only, I think, got a minute left, but what, what I, do you I, want? Just to respond to the last one. I, none of us disagree in here that you got to have pharma to build drugs. But the problem is that if we lose all of our trainees from academia, your student, your postdoc, your best faculty all move into pharma, what's going to be left of academia to train the next generation? And pharma it's, will I'm not do innovation. I'm damn glad that they're going out there. No, but Start treating those people as equals to you. That, that's what we're saying, that we need more funding so we can compete with the pharma keeping the best in academia. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Your job as an educator, in my opinion, is to educate a broad group of scientists to engage in all elements of society, not right. just academia. Yeah. All right, we've got three seconds left. <laughs> Do we want to? <laughs> Thank you. This is Linda Clever. Take another question. Does someone want to give me guidance? Take take another question, or do we? Is it time up? <laughs> Two qu quick questions. One: <laughs> What would happen if all scientists and physicians were taught how to communicate? Se we're, what would happen we're, if we're all scientists by, could you and repeat that if they were taught by what? What would happen if all scientists and physicians? We're taught how to communicate better. Great. Very important. Second, oh, I'll just do the second and get it over. I was just going to say the panel's done a good job of communicating this morning, but this afternoon. But go ahead. Second, what would happen if the National Academies and PBS started its own platform of communication instead of relying on Facebook? About communication. I can see a reality show. A reality <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that fun. A, a, a PBS style of reality show. <laughs> so it's evidence based and fact based. Let's give each one of our panelists a hand. <laughs> well, clearly we struck a nerve. Um, <laughs> I, um, I so appreciate this panel. Thank you so much, Judy and everyone, for your wonderful discussion and your answers. Thank you. So um, we will, if you, if you could hang here for two seconds, um, we're going to pose a question to gather your reactions and perspectives based on what you've heard. And so you can see the instructions on the screen. Just scan the QR code. And then you can go onto your smartphone, or if you have a um, uh, computer, and you enter the program code NAM2022, NAM2022, and answer the question. The question is, are you convinced that the challenges described by the panel justified and compelled and would compel major changes in our scientific enterprise? Give us a score from one to five. One is you're not convinced at all. I think there were a people that... And five is you're completely convinced. And I think we heard from both groups. Um, so we'd love to know what you think. And I'm going to pause for a second just to see what comes in. While we're waiting on those. Ah, there we go. The sick, the, um, aha. Uh -huh. Pretty good result. Thank you all. So um, now for lunch. For those here in person, please attend the general luncheon in the tent. And please note there are some students here uh, who participated in the DC Public Health Case Challenge. And they have their posters up in the grade hall during lunch. So um, 
This topic was community protective environments and preventing intimate partner violence. Stop and talk with them. We'll see you soon.